Well, with great pleasure, I wanted to introduce Patrick Hall with H2O. Um, I think H2O may be one of the few vendors that actually got invited twice, you know, this, to their second Spark Saturday. So, you, so your guy must have done a good job the first time around. <laughs> they all so, up, yeah. um, so we're really excited to have Patrick. He's a senior data scientist and product engineer at H2O. Um, he does, uh, uh, he focuses at HO on model interoperability. Um, he's also an adjunct professor with the Department of Decision Sciences at George Washington University. Um, and he teaches, uh, is model. that good? Yeah, that's good. Don't, you don't have to read it all. No, no, I'm it. highlighting just a okay. few quick ones, Patrick, just to embarrass you a little bit more. Um, and he teaches uh, data mining and machine learning classes. Um, and, you know, last night we had a great talk with Patrick, a riveting discussion on distributed computing, so mm -hmm. I hope he covers mm -hmm. that too. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, so uh, that's right. I'm, I'm Patrick. We're going to talk about gradient boosting uh, and sparkling water, so, uh, which is H2O's interface to Spark. Uh, so I, I think the way we'll do this, since it's a Saturday afternoon, um, I, I'll, I'll give a couple introductory slides, and then I'll go into the demo, okay? Because if I had to guess, that's what most people are here for or, or would like to learn about. And uh, then, then we'll get into some more details about gradient boosting. Uh, so with no further ado. All right. Oh, and we'll, we'll throw random forest in there, too, because that's easy. Once you talk about gradient boosting, you can kind of get random forest for free. Okay. So why, why, are we, why are we talking about uh, gradient boosting and not deep learning? Uh, so this, this tweet has been hanging out on Twitter for a while with no one, no one saying they've been able to beat GBM on this famous airline data set. Uh, and then recently, I made this little checklist, and I'm sure you guys can read this. Um, but so this... This got 1,000 views an hour for like 24 hours. I, I couldn't believe it. So at the, up at the top it says, should I use deep learning? So let's, let's work through the flow chart. Um, do you have images or sound? Well, then, yeah, maybe you should use deep learning. Do you have text? You could consider deep learning. Do you have sequences of events? Like they called the call center. We called them back. We sent them a letter. Then they turned. Not numbers. If you just have time series, then you do time series, and you don't do deep learning. Uh, or, and are you looking for anomalies? So, so these are these are what I would consider the main use cases for uh, deep learning. And everything else, right? We do what we all know we do. We do linear models, and we do GBM and random forest. Okay. So, so sort of what I'm, the argument I'm making with these first two slides is that. In the real world, these are the models that, that people use the most, OK? Uh, for, for sort of business problems, uh, transactional data, customer data, uh, this, this is the workhorse algorithm for nonlinear models, GBM. OK. So what is a GBM? Well, and, and same goes for random forest. They're both ensemble models, OK? So they're, they're ensembles of decision trees. And a decision tree is like a flow chart, OK? If someone's age is greater than 30, if their income is greater than this, if they live in this zip code, then their probability of buying the product is 0.3, OK? That, that's how a decision tree works. And so uh, random forest and gradient boosting are both just kind of like combining a bunch of different flow charts, right? A flow chart helps us make a decision from the data, and so a gradient boosting model, random forest model, is just kind of combining somehow, aggregating the decisions in all these, in, in many different flow charts. Um, so, so why? Why do we do this? Well, um, I'm sure there are people at Capital One or at your company who, when decision trees first came out 30 or 40 years ago, tried them. And we're like, we can't use this. It's not stable, right? One little thing in the data changes, and then the whole structure of the decision tree changes, OK? Um, 
when you actually have to do something important with data and not just tell dogs from cats or something else that four-year-olds can do, uh, you worry about stability. You worry about the stability of the model, okay? So ensemble models, when I combine all these different models together, one consequence of that is it makes the models much more stable, okay? Uh, so meaning that if I make, if there's some changes in my data set, I don't get totally different answers, okay? Um, another thing, and this is a little, the, a little bit more complex, um, so if I only have one model, then I only have sort of one uh, guess at what the most important variables are. But when I build all these different models, we typically build them on different samples of the data. And so in one sample, you know, one variable might be the most important, and then in another sample, a different variable might be the most important. And in that way, you know, different important variables get to have their say on how the model behaves. Okay, so that, that's another reason people think ensemble models work. Um, another thing is, uh, like I keep mentioning, you know, we, we build these decision trees on different samples of the data. And some of those samples probably just happen to look like what the new data we're going to be trying to make decisions about looks like. So we just kind of get lucky, right? Uh, we're making all these different little biased uh, biased samples, right? And then one of those samples that my model sees during the training part just happens to look a lot like what my data might look like when I go to score new data, all right? Um, if you're interested in more mathematical explanations, uh, so ensemble models decrease the variance. So variance is error that comes from when my model is very complicated and I go to score new data and it, the model is too complicated and it overfit my training data, and so I get a big error in my, in my new data when I go to score new data. So that's what variance is, and ensemble models decrease variance without increasing bias, okay? Bias is a kind of error that comes from when my model's just wrong, when my model's too simple, okay? So what ensemble models allow us to do is decrease variance without simplifying the model, okay? That's nice. And then, uh, Empirical risk minimization is kind of the most, that, there's very little theoretical work done on ensemble models, but most of it is in the field of empirical risk minimization. If you know what that is, I barely know what that is. Okay, so what is a random forest? Well, they were invented in the late 1990s by Leo Breiman, a very famous statistician at Berkeley. And what we do is we take a bunch of different samples of the data, and we build our, our flow charts, our decision trees, on the different samples, okay? And then we combine all these decisions together, okay? So a random forest is kind of a, you can build it in parallel, okay? So you can think of it as a parallel process. I, I get all these different samples of the data, I build a decision tree on each sample, and then I combine the results together, okay? So if we, if we are saying, um, is there going to be dessert later, right? We would take a bunch of samples of data. This tree says, this top tree says yes, middle tree says no, next tree says yes. Then the answer from the ensemble would be yes, because of two yeses and one no. Uh, if it's a numeric problem, like how much, how much will they charge, charge me for dessert? You know, the top tree says $1, next tree says $2, next tree says $1. So then uh, the answer would be $1.33, something like that, okay? So, so we, we build these different models and we combine them in the end. Now, gradient boosting is a little bit more complicated. Uh, in gradient boosting, same idea, we make all these different samples of the data set, but then, and we build one decision tree on the data. And then the next decision tree tries to make that decision tree better, the first decision tree. The second decision tree tries to make the first two decision trees better. The third decision tree, you know, and on and on and on and on. So every additional tree in a gradient boosting ensemble models the error of all the trees that have come before it. And that's why it's called gradient boosting, okay? Uh, this sequential process of one model making another model better, that's called boosting. And we call gradient boosting because in what we model in each round is the error from the model before it, 
okay? So that's, that's your intro to gradient boosting. So now let's, let's go into the demo. Okay. So here's my trusty Jupyter notebook. Can you guys see that? Does it need to be bigger? Can you see in the back? Let me see what happens if I zoom in one more time. Mm, seems okay. Okay. So uh, if you want to follow up on this later, here's, the, here's some URLs that might be interesting to you. Um, I'm using something called PySparkling, which is uh, the Python API to H2O sparkling water, okay? And uh, just briefly, sparkling water is a memory map between uh, Spark data structures, RDDs and Spark data frames, and H2O data structures, H2O frames, okay? And it's also uh, Scala API, a Python API, and now an R API, all right? So the basic idea with sparkling water is you can use nice things in Spark, like Spark SQL, to do uh, data prep, and then you copy the RDD or the Spark data frame over into H2O's memory space, okay? And then we can run, then H2O can run our machine learning algorithms on it. So that's the basic idea of sparkling water. Okay, so um, we're gonna import H2O, so that's the H2O Python module. Um, we're gonna import PySpark. I assume you guys probably know way more about that than I do. Um, and we're gonna import PySparkling, okay? And I just pip installed all this, this, I'd never done this before, okay? And I just pip installed all this while I was sitting out of the table this morning. Um, oh, and I, sh yeah, if you're, if you're interested, I can show you the web page that has all the instructions, it's not hard. Okay, so we're gonna define a couple helper functions to do, to do data cleaning, okay? Because we all know that's where all the hard work goes in machine learning problems anyway, data mining problems anyway. So, so we have some helper functions for, for, doing the, uh, for doing the data cleaning. All right, and now this step is how we start Spark and H2O at the same time, okay? Um, so I have, a, I have a Spark cluster just on my laptop, and then uh, it's, I'm gonna be communicating with H2O at this uh, local URL, that's just localhost 54321. Um, I've got some nice things in here. I've got XGBoost, which is a very popular gradient boosting algorithm. Um, I've got H2O's machine learning algorithms. I've got something called AutoML, which is a way to combine a bunch of machine learning algorithms. So um, I just kind of get a status report of what, what goodies I've got. Now, um, in this step, I load the data into H2O. So h2o.upload file, uh, it has a really nice parser, and it's, it's a multi-threaded and distributed ingest, if that's something you're interested in. So we're gonna load it into H2O. Uh, we're gonna use some basic Python syntax to, to fix up the data set a little bit. There's, and, and you'll notice we've loaded three different data sets, okay? So we're doing stuff like making the column names nice because we know we're gonna wanna send them to Spark to do some real work later, okay? So that's basically what we're doing. We made the, we made the column names nice so that we could use them more easily in a, in a Spark SQL join that we're gonna do in just a second. So we have these three H2O frames, okay? Now I need to do this complex join that would be really hard to do with H2O and it would be a extremely slow in pandas, if, if even impossible. So um, I'm gonna ship my data from H2O's memory to Spark's memory, okay? So that's what I'm doing here. As, as Spark frame, okay? So I'm taking my three data sets that were H2O frames and now I'm making them into Spark, uh, Spark data frames. And I'm registering them as tables so I can do Spark SQL and then I do this fairly complex join where I'm joining three different tables, okay? So I'm trying to join three different disparate tables into one data set that I'm gonna build a model on, 
Okay? And so I'm using Spark SQL, not anything crazy, but this, this would be a pain, if this was big data, it would be really slow to do in pandas. Um, and you know, Spark has spill over to disk, all this kind of stuff. And then if you had really huge data, we wouldn't even be talking about that. It'd all be in memory on multiple machines. But from my perspective, I think this is cool because um, you know, now I can do joins on big data and have it spill to disk and not have to do SAS. Uh, so it's nice. Okay, so now we, we do the join, and now we're taking it back to H2O. Uh, I am saying, I'm telling the model some of these columns need to be treated as categorical columns. Okay, so maybe they're string variables, or it's something like one, two, three, where one, two, three aren't numbers, they signify some kind of class. Uh, I'm going to split my data into training and tests because we don't want to overfit our pesky machine learning models. Um, and then I'm saying we are uh, going to try to predict arrest. So this is the Chicago crime data. We're going to try to predict a column called arrest from all the other columns. I import my, and then, see, this is why I had to import the H2O package. So I'm, I'm just importing the H2O uh, API for gradient boosting machines. And then I'm going to call the gradient boosting machine. So I instantiate it, and then I call it, and it trains. And I can get all kinds of nice information. It's overfitting. Here's my iteration plot. I can see what the most important variables were, uh, the type of crime, the location. And this IUCR, I had to look that up. That's an Illinois uh, sort of crime designation. Um, and I can, I can get like the mean response, the mean prediction for all these different kinds of uh, arrest. Okay? And then remember I said we can talk to H2O at this uh, localhost 54321. Okay? So I might do something like model, list all models. Here's the Python GBM model that I trained. I can, I can take a better look at it here, get some, uh, again, iteration plot. AUC, how good is the model? We want this, model, we want this blue curve to be up, up and to the left if it's a good model. Uh, again, variable importance. Lift, gain, these are all kind of standard metrics that um, data scientists, analysts look at to decide if the model's good. This model's pretty good. We can do better. Uh, and then something that I think is really crucially important is every H2O model, and not just the GBM, will generate this Java score code. Okay, So this is automatically generated Java code that I can download and hand off to my data engineers or to IT or whoever it is that's actually responsible for taking this model off my laptop where it's basically worthless to a large organization and to putting it somewhere where it can be used in production to uh, derive savings or profits for a large organization. Okay? Um, so just a nice kind of perk about H2O is you get this piece of Java code that you can use as a decision engine in your own uh, in your own applications. OK, so any, any questions about the demo or the basic ideas behind sparkling water? On the uh, going from like Spark to H2O, there's like end of reformat. Yes. Have you, how expensive is that? It's very expensive. I know we, yeah, I know we're looking into Arrow. Um, so, so he brings up a good point. When I, when I smash my data from Spark to H2O, you need up to double the size of the data set, right? Because we're just making a copy. Now, uh, H2O does a lot of different kinds of compression, so it's, it's rarely actually double. But um, it is a good point. When I do this copy, either way, Either place I do this copy, both of these data sets have to exist in memory at the same time. Like after I copy it from Spark to H2O, I can delete it from Spark. After I copy it from H2O to Spark, I can delete it from H2O. 
but there is, a, there is a moment in time where both of these data sets have to exist in memory. Okay, good point. Any other questions? about uh, either sparkling water or the demo? Sure, please. We're, and we're gonna get into more details about GBM, but you know, I wanted to spare people who didn't want to talk about math, not having to talk about math. Sure. Spark is extremely powerful for data manipulation. And so that's the idea, right? I wanna, I wanna leverage Spark, and particularly Spark SQL, to get my data sets ready. And then when I want to do machine learning, I push it into H2O to do machine learning. So you're changing the format in some fashion. Yes, it's very, some, from one complex in-memory format to another complex in-memory format. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other question? Anything else before we move on? Sure. Yes, that is an excellent question. Okay. So his... With these complex machine learning models, right, um, it's very easy to generate a model where just the little if-then rules, okay, just writing out the little if-then rules, okay, so I, I, in the beginning I said a decision tree is like a rule list, right, if the person's over than 30, if they live in this zip code. Um, so here, here's our first tree, okay. Oops, here's our first tree, and you can actually see if you're a Java programmer, like here's my little if-then statements, all right? So these are very simple trees. It is not uncommon for the source code that defines these models to grow up to like 300, 500 megabytes, okay? Um, it's not uncommon to have millions and millions of rules. So what he's saying is if I have a 500 megabyte class, what do I do with that, okay? Or, or God, what if I have to compile a 500 megabyte file? So um, that's a very good question. And the answer to it, I'm hoping it's just gonna pop up on the screen. Okay, so that's called, what I just showed is called the POJO, plain old Java object. But this is MOJO, model optimized Java object. So it's pre-compiled. Okay, so the, the trees are pre-compiled. So you don't have to class load them and you don't have to compile them. Okay? So, so I would say actually if, if you're like my group is working with H2O and you're really looking for a best practice, right, not just some kind of silly intro, um, this is new, the mojo is new, and it's probably a best practice, right? And if you, we've, we've done some studies. If you have extremely small, simple models, the POJO will score faster. But for everything except extremely small, simple models, Mojo's faster and it's easier to use. And it's, it's, uh, you just drop it in place, right? Whatever code you have for POJO, the exact same code works for Mojo, okay? So Mojo is probably the best sort of industrial best practice, right? And it's just pre-compiled Java code. It's Java byte code. Um, I think because we were able to do some optimizations in the binaries for how we represent trees, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, all I can say is um, the, the co-founder of, um, of H2O, and he's not with us anymore, unfortunately, but the co-founder of H2O invented a little piece of software known as the Java Hotspot Compiler. So we have some fairly intimate um, Java knowledge in-house. It's not in my brain. Okay, it's not in my brain. Uh, but yeah, so, so they do crazy stuff with Java code. These are all good questions. Any, anything else? Okay, so I know I kind of blew through like what in the world is a GBM, and we're gonna, now we're gonna get back to that and talk about that in a little bit more detail. But if you have other questions you know, about how this might work, so again, the basic idea was I loaded it into H2O. You might prefer to load it into Spark. Um, then I do some data preparation, and typically that's what we're going to want to leverage Spark for, and then we push it back into H2O to do the machine learning, to, to do the, the model that learns how to make predictions. So that was here, the GBM. And then I want to emphasize, um, personally, someone who has been doing this for a while, maybe even successfully, um, 
I don't think that a laptop, a model sitting on a data scientist laptop in a big organization is, has any value at all. It's actually just an expense, okay? It's a cost center. Paying data scientists to do this is just a cost center. So, so how, do you, how do you take that logic and deploy it somewhere where it's actually useful, right? And H2O's answer for, for that is this generated Java uh, source code or generated Java binaries that represent the model decision. OK, so let's go back and talk about GBM a little bit more in detail. OK. So when we train a GBM, we do what's called sampling with replacement. Um, we've, that, the rectangle uh, on the left is supposed to represent a data set, OK? And I'm saying we're taking little uh, observations from it. We're taking rows from it, right? But trees, each, each little decision tree can see the same piece of data. Um, so, so we're, that's sampling with replacement, right? Like maybe you get row two, another tree gets row two, another tree gets row two. And so the trees see different parts of the data. And then what's going on and, and with some overlap. And then like I said, each tree is trying to make the tree before it better. Okay, well how do we do that? So I, I, I was trying to spare people from math. I warned you. So, um, we do that by what happens in between each tree is we try to model the loss, OK? So my first tree, it makes some guess about the predictions. What, what crime is someone going to commit? Or you know, are we going to have dessert later? Or, or whatever it is, someone going to default on their credit card. Um, and then the tree after that, instead of modeling the original phenomenon, it models the difference between um, the predicted of the tree before it and the actual, OK? And that's, why, that's the gradient boosting, OK? Because we're modeling the gradient. We're modeling the error. Each tree makes the model a little bit better, OK? And we have these different loss functions because, well, so for the top one, the squared loss, the Gaussian loss, is just for doing simple regression problems. Um, the binomial loss is you know, credit default. Is, is someone going to pay their loan back, yes or no? Uh, Poisson is for modeling rates. So you, you, wanna, you do want to think about this, OK? You do want to think about this. And when you're using H2O, you get to pick, and many other machine learning libraries, you get to pick. And you want to make sure that you match your loss function up with the project that you're actually working on, OK? So if you're doing something like modeling insurance rates, you will get a better model if you don't use squared loss, OK? If you use something called the Tweety, if you, if you tell your model that your Y variable has a Tweety distribution or a gamma distribution, so, and that, that has its own loss function that goes along with it that's not one of these, but, but that will give you a better answer than if you just say, oh, treat it like squared loss, OK? Because what's going on in between all these trees is it's applying this formula, and whatever this y minus y hat squared for each row, predicted minus actual for each row, that's what the next tree is going to model, OK? And so you want to make sure that the, the loss function and the distribution family you pick matches up with the actual problem you're doing, OK? So again, the first one is just for regular regression. Uh, it's very uh, affected by outliers. I see you have a question. Exactly. So he, he was saying, you know, are you, are you saying you do binomial for binomial regression and you do Poisson for Poisson regression? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Probably I could have said it a lot simpler. Um, the square, I always, I always like to caution people about squared loss. Squared loss is really affected by outliers, okay? And in real data, we almost always have outliers. So be careful about that. And there's something called hu Huber loss, H-U-B-E-R, that can be better in a lot of cases. OK, so how, how do we distribute this? How do we, dis how do we distribute our machine learning in, in H2O for decision trees? So when I'm making a decision tree, I have to, uh, I'm making all these splits, right? I'm trying to decide, well, if they're over 30, then this happens. If they're under 30, then this happens. If their income is greater than this, this happens. If it's less than this, then this happens. And that cutoff point is really important. That's, that's how all the decisions get made. And so the way we do that is we make histograms of the data. And we, and we look for good points to cut the histogram in two. 
So uh, creating histograms is actually pretty expensive because it involves sorting. Sorting and binning. So what we do is we make, we make our histograms out on each node, OK? So each node has some set of the data. It sorts it. It makes its histograms. And then we ship the shape of the histogram, which is cheap. You know, it's just a JSON file, uh, or, or however they're persisting it, or in whatever the in-memory structure is. We ship that back to, the, to one node, OK? So this is one place. Um, where H2O and, and Spark are quite different, and, and this does cause technical problems, and if we have time, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, H2O is not fault tolerant, OK? H2O expects all nodes to exist at all time, because they're constantly checking in with each other, right? And so when you're running sparkling water, and, and this is, you would want to use the Spark 2.0 versions if you don't want this to happen to you. It really only happens on big clusters. But H2O, uh, you know, I think Spark, when uh, when a node basically isn't getting used, Spark will shut it down. That'll crash H2O, OK? H2O is constantly checking in on all its nodes, OK? And it, the computations are designed so that the nodes are allowed to communicate with each other, right? So that's one thing. That's a big difference between um, the way H2O does distributed computation and the way Spark and, and Hadoop do distributed computation. Not, H2O is not fault tolerant. OK. So um, how, do we, how do we make our model more or less complex, right? How do we, how do we get more complexity in the model to, to be able to get better answers? So um, the biggest thing is the number of trees, right? The more decision trees I use in my model, the more accurate my model has the chance of being. Um, and then the deeper the trees, OK, so the tree depth. The number of trees and the depth of the trees. Those are the biggest thing. Now, of course, it gets slower. It takes more and more time. The bigger, my, the bigger my model gets, the more and more time it takes to train, and the more and more time it takes to do inference, the more and more time it takes to score, right? If I have a 5,000 tree model, I have to run a row of data through all 5,000 of those sets of if-then statements to get my answer out at the end, all right? Um, and then typically we want to stop. Um, we want to stop when we're watching. We have a holdout set, and we're watching the error on that holdout set. Remember when I did the demo? I had a train test, I had a train set, and a test set. Okay, so we want to watch the error on that test set in real time. Okay, and when the error stops getting better on the test set, that's when we stop. It's different than building a linear model, you know, a, a model that's basically a straight line or a plane. They're not as susceptible to overfitting, OK? But this is, we're built, a gradient boosting machine is a very nonlinear model. And uh, it has the ability to just kind of completely memorize the training data. And we want, so that's what we're trying to avoid, OK? So we, we always keep this test set and we monitor the error, you know, OK, at 100 trees. The, the error was still going down on the test set. At 200 trees, it was still going down. Uh, oh, but it, you know, at whatever, 300 trees, it, it stopped getting better in the test set. And we cut it off there, OK? Because we don't want to over-memorize the training data. So there's different ways to do this validation. If you have really big data, which I imagine some of you do, and that's why you're here, uh, typically you will do this thing where you just kind of have a static training set, a static validation set, a static uh, test set, and, uh, and you'll just monitor the model's performance on each of those three different sets. If you have smaller data or bigger computers, uh, you can do something called cross-validation. And that's where we like divide the data into five segments train the model on four of the segments, see how it did on one of the holdout segments. OK, then we switch it up. Now we have a different one of those data segments as a holdout, and we use the other four to train. And we do that five times. That's an example of cross-validation. And that, that is a way to make models that, that tend to do better in their predictions, but you can see how that would be very computationally expensive if you have a big data set. OK. Um, 
Another good rule is uh, all of these models, like if I look at H2O model, gradient boosting machine, I have all these different knobs to tune, OK? What are all these things? Who knows? So you need to establish a baseline, or you'll drive yourself crazy. So like, I picked 100 trees, OK? It did OK. I make a little note about what happened. Then I train 150 trees. If you start changing a bunch of things at the same time, this is what always happens. This is what always happens. Um, you're like going in a good direction, and you've been sitting there for two hours, and it's getting better and better. And then you change three things at the same time, and then your model is terrible, and you can't remember exactly what you've changed, and uh, you know you've just wasted a lot of time. So establish a baseline and take small steps away from that baseline if you're new to this. Um, if you are not new to this, you want to do something called grid searching, and that's something that H2O enables very easily. OK. Um, any questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so questions. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember if we report out of bag error or not. We do, we just, we do this, we keep our API the same. It's just train, train validate test. Oh, for both the right yeah. And yeah, yeah. And, but we may report out of bag. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure off the top of my head. That's not true. No, 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 that's not true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so any, any other questions about the GBM before we move on? All right, let me see if there's anything else I want to squeeze in in the last three minutes. Um, so if you're more experienced, you want to do something called hyperparameter search, OK? So that solves the problem of, uh, you know, I have all these knobs to tune, so how, what do I pick? What do I do? Well, what hyperparameter searching does is it automatically runs through a bunch of different models with different settings for all the different knobs, OK? And it will just track for you which model did the best. So this is, this is certainly the more professional uh, solution to the problem. And, and if it's something that if you have a little bit more experience, I would really urge you to do. And H2O, a lot of different software platforms do this. H2O has you know, a convenient API for doing this. So basically what this is saying is um, it would try a model with max depth of 1, with learning rate of 0.01, da 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 da, and it would, it would eventually cycle all the way through this list. That can be very expensive. So another strategy that people do is called uh, random grid search. And it turns out, actually, random grid search has been proven mathematically that if I randomly build models from this list, not try to build every model that this list suggests, but I just kind of randomly build models defined by attributes in these lists, uh, that I, it, you will not do worse than trying them all, OK? So random grid search can be very efficient, and that's something that H2O supports. And, Again, if you're a little bit more experienced, I would uh, I'd urge you to check that out. OK. One last thing. So uh, oh, any questions? Because I'm going to run up. I'm going to run up against time if you guys don't ask me questions. Please. So, so you, could, you could easily build an extremely large full combinatorial experiment, right? And, uh, and we, we generally want to avoid that. So random grid search is nice because you can search a giant space that would be very hard to search if we just did the full combinatorial experiment, OK? Just pick up one value. Yes, just randomly pick one value from each list and build a model, and then move on, all right? And, and if, that, if you haven't tried random grid search, you should. It's awesome, OK? Any other, any other questions? All right, I'll, I'll finish with my the spiel. So, uh, these models are oftentimes regarded as black boxes. And to a certain degree, that's true. They can be very complicated and hard to explain to people. But it's not that they're not explainable. 
Okay, so one thing to think about, like if you're just getting started with gradient boosting machines or, or machine learning, you should think, um, am I going to be able to explain this model to my boss or my colleagues, and is that going to be a problem? Okay? Because they're much more difficult to explain than, uh, than traditional linear models. And what you're seeing here is a partial, what's called a partial dependence plot. And this is one way that people explain these models. And it's easy in H2O. It's easy in R. Uh, and they essentially just tell you the, what's on the y-axis is the average model prediction. And then you have standard deviation top and above it and below it. And then you run across the domain of one of the input variables. So this is essentially saying what's the average prediction at this value of an input variable. All right, we're over, we're over time. Anything else? We should be done. Yay. <laughs>